Okay, so today we will talk about the biodiversity of the India Tidal System in Taiwan. So I, I'm Dr. Benny K.K. Chen. So we will talk about the, the India Tidal environment. That means that is the environment is, uh, which, which is located at the junction between the sea and land. So and then this is, is the habitat which will be immersed in water during high tides and then will be exposed to air during low tides. So actually tide will be a very important factor to control the ecology of animals and plants in these systems. So maybe you will ask why it is important to study the inner tidal systems. So think about the, world, the map of the world. So think about how many countries have the coastlines, actually uh, have the inner, inner tidal environment. So you, if you look at the map of the world, you can see actually most of countries have their own coastline. That means the coastline is composed of a sandy shore, mangroves, uh, rocky shore and also artificial shorelines and all these shorelines are in the tidal environments and have important e e ecological uh, roles so that means actually studying about the inner tidal system can compare to a lot of work around the world and this study is, uh, have, have a global importance so the aim of the lecture today will talk about firstly what are the inner tidal ecosystems and then we will focus on biodiversity of the species in the inner tidal systems. So the learning outcome of the lecture today will be, so at the end of the lecture, you should be able to, we will be able to describe the major inner tidal organism living in Taiwan. And then we will talk about the conservation of the Taiwan inner tidal environment. So as we talk, in the beginning of the lecture, so tides are a very important factor to control the ecology of the ecosystems in the intertidal zones. So we talk about what are tides. So how tides is generated, and they are generated by the interaction of the earth cell rotations and also the gravitational pull of moon and sun. So in general, in one day, there will be two high tides and two low tides a day in most of the places in the world. So if you look at the tide map of Hawaii here, so we'll show that actually, in the graph, there will be one, two, three, four, there are six days of the tidal patterns. So in each day, you will see that there will be two high tide and two low tides a day. But however, the, two, the tidal amplitude of the high tide and low tide are different. But as a conclusion, there will be two high tide and two low tide in one day. So if there are two high tide and two low tides in one day, that means the inner tidal environment will be exposed to air two times a day and each time about six hours in, in, in time period. So let's talk about Taiwan inner tidal systems. So Taiwan is a big island located in the northwest Pacific. But however, Taiwan has very diverse marine systems. So in the north, from the north coastline to northeast coast, we have the, the, the coastline in the East China Sea, and this belongs to the East China Sea systems. And then on the east coast of Taiwan, we have Hualin to Taitung, and these actually are the coastline facing the Pacific Ocean, and this system is affected by the warm current, cool shear current in, in the Pacific Ocean. And then the west coast of Taiwan are located in the Taiwan Strait, and this region are very shallow water, the water is about 60 meters, and this belongs to the Taiwan Strait marine systems. So we have a Taiwan, Taiwan is, is our islands, but we always have three marine systems in, in our, our Taiwan island. So since Taiwan has three different marine systems, so that's why we have very high diversity of species, and, and that, that's why we have a lecture here to introduce about the inner tidal biodiversity of Taiwan animals and plants. So talking about the inner tidal animal will be related to the word called soil nations. So what is mean by soil nation patterns? That means actually the species on the inner tidal zones are distributed in, in bands, in a layer of high shore animals, a layer of low shore animals, and a layer of uh, uh, subtitled animals. So the, the animals looking at, uh, or, or living on the shore are, are distributed in bands. And this is called the sonation patterns. So to, taking an example of uh, a rocky shore on, on the northeast coast, so we will find that actually on, on the high shore, we will have our uh, high shore animals, so which are, are colonized by this tiny animal called the Nordic species and with some small sized barnacles, kefamers, and with the crabs, crabless species. And then going down on the mid shore, we will find the limpus, 
and also the larger size barnacles and the stock barnacles. And going down low on the shore, we will, we will, ex uh, we will explore the, the sea urchins, the big barnacles, and the bivalves. So now let's look at high shores. So the high shore, actually in Taiwan, we have three species of tiny snail called the Nordic So the, the species are Nordic rhinus, Trochoides, uh, Ridgewa, and Radiatus. So if in summer, if you go to the northeast coast and have a look on the high shore, you will see these snail are actually, they clump together in, in a clump. So, so you see a clump of a clump snail on, on the shore. So maybe you will ask why the snail, they, they like to live in groups but rather than just disperse randomly. This is because if the snail living in clumps, this can actually increase the humidity around the clumps, and this can actually can enhance their survival and reduce their mortality. This is because on high shore, it's a very hot and dry environment, so species living in clumps can actually reduce the stress they will experience on, on high shore. And then, you, we're going down on the mid shore, we found a lot of Molluscia, and they are called, in general, they are called grazers. So what is mean by grazers? Grazer means actually it's animal feeding on algae. So the grazer will include the chitons, a canvaper japonica. So chiton is quite easy to be identified on the shore because you, if you look at the shell plate uh, or the dorsal side of animal, you will find that actually the chiton have a place of shell on, on, on their dorsal side. And the other important grazers are the limpus, the Chalana toruma and the Chalana guata species. And also we have a lot of uh, gastropod, there are also grazers, which include the monodonta labial. Monodonta means actually you can see the, uh, the, the opercula of the snail shell have one teeth, so that's, that's why they call monodonta. And then you will find the, another snail, Neroita, and also Corestoma on the low shore. So all these kinds of a snail are called grazer because they are feeding on algae. But by how this grazer can feed on algae, so if you dissect the animals and then have a look, you will find that actually the grazers will have a, a, a chain of teeth, which is called the radulas. And this radula, it have a sharp teeth in a chain, so when the snail is moving, the sharp teeth will graze on, on, on the rock, and this action can actually scrap off the algae and, and, and digest algae, ingest the algae in, in the body of the, gra the grazers. So that's why they're called Grazers, because the red is grazed on, on the shore to graze around the algae. So now let, let, let's look at the limpus, one of the grazers in details. So limpus actually have a, 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 a depressed a conical shell on the shore. So some species is quite interesting, because if you go to the northeast coast and you collect a limpus, and you, if you pull them up, you will find that actually the wall will have uh, exactly marks of the shell on, on the shore, which it, this mark is actually depressed to into the world. So we will ask why the world will have an exact shape of the shell of limpus, and how the limpus can, can create a depression of, of the world which fitting the, the, the shells. This is because this is related to something, it's called a homing behavior. So what it mean by the homing behavior, that means the limpet will go home after feeding. So the limpet is attached on, on, on the rock and taking rest when, when, when they are not feeding. So when the tide is high and they experience some sea, sea splash, some species will actually start, leave, start moving and then go to out for feeding. And other feeding, the limpet will go home, that means they will go back to the same position and taking rest. So if times go by, every time the limpet go out and go back, they stay, stay on the original positions, and this will create a mark on, 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 on the rock, and also create some depression on the rock, which is exactly fit the shell, and this is called a home scar. So any homing species, the limpet will leave a home scar on, on, on the shore, which the, the scar is exactly fitting the shape of the shell. So how to do some experiments to prove that limpet have some homing behavior? So can you think about some experiment you can prove that limpets will, will go home after feeding? So some study outside Taiwan, actually they study about the behavior of limpets. And how they do so is actually they stick an LED lamp on the shell of the limpets. So the LED lamp will, will emit the light, and then the researcher will take a video camera to video, video the, the, the behavior of limpet. So during night, at night, so there will be a lamp which locate, which is indicate the, the position of the limpet. So when they move, the lamp will move as well. So they can actually trace about the, the, the movement of the, of the limpet. So if you, if you examine the graph here, we can see that actually 
for the homing behavior uh, of, of some living which have the homing behavior, they will actually start leaving the, the whole biscara during feedings, and then after feeding, they will actually have a new turns, and then they will return following the, the similar pathway where they, they depart from the home scar and then they go back to home. So looking at the homing pathway, so you can see this actually are uh, the example of two limpets, A and B, and then actually for each individual, they have about uh, four or to five homing, uh, homing trails. So you can see the first one of A, and they're moving southwards at uh, the beginning, and then they're also going back to the same position after feedings, and the second, third, and fourth, fifth trails, again the same, they depart the home scar, and then they follow the, the same pathway, and back to the home scar again, and same pattern as in B as well. So we can see actually, how the limpet is home properly is they need to follow the initial pathway back to the home, and this is, is some, some species which they have homing behavior. So you can also compare about the end goal of the leaving direction and, and the forward direction. You can see that actually this is a high correlation between the, the leaving direction and the forward direction. That means actually the, the way they're going to feeding and the way they're going to come back is the same pathway. That means actually when they're going out, when they're going back, actually they follow the same pathway to go back to the home scar. So we have talked about some limpet. We have homing behavior and they have home scar. But however, not all limpet have homing behavior. Some limpet do not. So don't, don't confuse all limpet have homing behavior. So some limpet are, are not homes. So for example, uh, in Taiwan, we have another limpet species called Chanana Grata, which they have no homing behavior. And their activity pattern is, is on, only random moving on, on the shore. But they have some activity which respond to ties. So if you look at the graph here, so it seems all the limpet will active during high tides because when, when the tide actually splash the shore, they will wet the limpets, and then the limpet will, will feel that it's now high tide, and they start moving. So during high tide, the limpet will be moving around the shore to feedings, and then they will stop uh, to feeding during low tide. So the, the, the feeding pathway is, is random. Whenever there's high tide, they will move around, and during low tide, they will just, just stop to taking rest. So this is some behavior of limpet which do not have homing, but the response will be actually initiated by tides. And on the mid shore, because there are a lot of grazers, so we have all, a lot of algae and some bacteria as well. So on the, on the Taiwan shore, we have a lot of red and brown algae, and also we have a lot of crust and crusting some bacteria, and this actually supports the life of the grazers. So talking about limpets, we will know that some limpets will homing and some limpets will not homing, and they are feeding on algae and they are grazers. So now let's talk about barnacles, which are another important uh, animals on the shores. So what are barnacles? So uh, maybe a lot of people are not familiar with barnacles, but barnacles are crustaceans. Although they have a, a conical shell, it's, it's put by themselves. They are crustaceans because they actually have a six pair of appendages inside. That their body looks like shrimps. So if you look at a, po a photograph of barnacle here, you can see actually during high tide, the barnacle, the body will extend out of the shell they have a six pair of legs for and capturing foot, and they are suspension feeders. That means their foot will capture the, the plankton for, for, for feeding. And if you see the section diagram here, you can see actually they have six pair of legs, and actually the, the opening of the shell is protected by a pair of sculptum and turgums. So in Taiwan, there we have a lot of species of barnacles. So we can see actually on, on, the, on the left, top left corner is a, a giant barnacle, Megabarnus volcano, then this is on the old lower shore. And then on, on, on the uh, top right hand corner, we have the Tetraclita barnacles, which are common on hard meat shores. And then we have the stock barnacle, Capuchin metella, which have a stock here. But they're also the barnacle because uh, actually inside the body is still a barnacle body with six pair of legs. And then the, the top, uh, the, the lower left corner is the the following species, Amphibanalus, which is quite common on, on a lot of shelter shore and, and also on artificial coastlines. So barnacles do actually relate to a very famous person, Charles Darwin. So maybe a lot of people will, will understand about Charles Darwin is the, his famous uh, publication, Origin of Species. But however, before Charles Darwin actually published his Origin of Species, he was a barnacle taxonomist. 
So he worked on the, the classification and taxonomy of barnacle for 10 years. And, do, and after this 10 years, he produced four big volumes of barnacle books. So two on fossil barnacles and two on living barnacles. And these four volumes of books still using nowadays and is uh, one of the important references in barnacle taxonomies. So Charles Darwin is a barnacle taxonomist and he has also using barnacle as an ex example to demonstrate barnacle, uh, phylogeny and also origin of species. So barnacle are hermaphrodites and most of species are hermaphrodites. That means actually the same barnacle body, we have the, we have the penis and also the ovary together. But however, the male and female sex organ will be mature at different times. So maybe this, this month the barnacle can behave as male and then the next month they will behave as female. So the male and female will change with time to, uh, <coughs> according to the, the environmental factors. But if they are hermaphrodite, how barnacle will uh, mating together? So a uh, barnacle have the male, male sex organ, the penis. So th since barnacle, they cannot move. They actually are, are, are stick on, on the rock and, and they cannot move. So the penis will extend out of the shell and then they to find out of an, another individual for matings. So actually, in terms of relative length, barnacle have the longest penis in the animal kingdom because they cannot move, so that they must have a long penis, extend out the shell, and to, and to search for, for, for neighbor individuals, and then fertilize for, for the female this time. So barnacles have a very long penis. So the adult barnacle, they cannot move, but however, actually the, the life cycle consists of two stages. So they have the planktonic larval stage, and the sex cell. Sex cell means they cannot move sex cell adult stage. So on the planktonic larval stage, the, the the larvae of barnacle, that means they can disperse in the water column. The larvae can swim around the water column and disperse to other places and then fertile and become a sexual barnacle again. And the barnacles, like uh, larvae, larvae, they have a sex lobular stage for, for, for allowing them to swim in, in the water columns. And then before settlements and become a sexual barnacle, the larvae will metamorph become a secret larvae. That means, it, it, that means it's the last stage of the larvae developments. And the secret larvae is, is very special because they have a pair of attenues on, 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 on the anterior side of the body. And this attenue can allow them to walk along the, 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 the substratum on the shore. They can feel actually whether this, this, this walk and, and this substratum is good for them to settle. Because once they settle, they, they cannot move. So they must choose a, a place which is, is the best for, their, for the rest of their life. So that the barnacle larvae can actually have the, a pair of attenues walking around the shore and they have a lot of seed taste to, to taste around the chemical sense and also the physical structure of the rock. If they are this good, they will settle. If not, they will actually leave in the rock and find an, an, another place again. And barnacles, in terms of, of economy, there are also one kind of important seafood in Japan and in Brazil and also in Spain and Portugal. So actually in Spain, they were eating a, a stock barnacle called a polycipis, uh, uh, polycipis species and this actually is, is very expensive because it's quite hard to collect in, in Spain and Portugal and in Brazil they also have the canned barnacle, barnacle are selling cans so you can, you can open a can and enjoy the barnacle mussels and then in Japan they also eat the mega bananas and also capitulums and, and using the cooking soup and steam it so barnacle is, is a very expensive seafood in Japan and also in, in Spain and Portugal and in South America as well So we finished about some, something interesting on barnacles, and then we'll talk about on, on the rocky shore, subtitle shore, we have some hermit crab and sea anemones. So we want to demonstrate some species actually have some interesting relation between uh, the, the two species together. So today we'll talk about the hermit crabs, which is called the dandana species. So I think everyone will know what is called a hermit crab. So hermit crab is actually a crustacean. They were, they were actually protected by, by, by an empty molluscan shell, and this is called hermit crab. However, some species will stick a sea anemone on, on, on the top of the shell. So what is the use of the sea anemone on, on the shell? Because actually, if the hermit crab shell have a sea anemone, it, this can reduce the chance of being predated by other species. And the sea anemone can also have benefit as well, because the sea anemone can be carried carry around uh, to other places, a lot of places by the hermit crab, and this will have a mutual benefit together. So however, for, for the species Dandanus, when they actually, they're molting, the hermit crab will leave in the shell and then they find an, an, another empty shell to, for, for, for larger empty shell for, for them to grow. And after going to the empty shell, half of the sea anemone, 
to 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 the Hermit Crab will leave to see a lemon leaf on 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 the empty shell, or they will actually we call it a new new individual to to replace the one on on the shell. So the answer is actually the Hermit Crab will pick up the old sea lemon leaf and place it back to the to the own shell, and then to, to continue the the, the the relationship. So this seems is uh, uh, some kind of old friendship together. The Hermit Crab and the sea lemon are good friends, and after even the Hermit Crab changed the shell. The hermit crab will pick up the sea anemone and place it back to the to the site to the new shell, and then actually the two species are living together for a long time. Okay, so we have finished some uh, diversity pattern of species on rocky shore in Taiwan. So now, if we go to the, the west coast of Taiwan, so there is actually a lot of sandy shore and 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 soft shore and mangrove, and actually of almost the whole west coast of Taiwan are full of uh, the soft shore, including the mangrove and sandy shores. And so we will also introduce about the diversity pattern of species on these shores. So similar to rocky shore, the sandy shore also have the sonation pattern of species. So on the high shore, you will find that actually there is some strand line. That means it's the, 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 the area where the highest tide can reach, and then this leaving a lot of uh, the plant detritus on, on, on the shore, and this mark the strand line. So, so, so the strand line is the, the, the water marks which, if, which the highest water can reach on the, on the beach. So then this, this strand line is quite useful for camping as well. So if you want to go camping, you, you, you need to set a camp beyond the strand line. Or if you set a camp below the strand line, that means maybe at night when the, when the tide becomes high, your camp will get flooded. So that is an important line for, for some, some, some people who like camping. So along the strand line, we will see actually there are a lot of crab holes with quite large size. So what are those crab? And these crab are called ghost crab. So they're, they're called under the genus Oxypody. So why they're called ghost crab? Because this crab can move at very high speed, and actually the, the color of the crab is similar to the same, so it just look, look, look like ghost or kind of one. So that they call it, they, they call, that's why they call ghost crab. So if the ghost crab have very large burrow, and the ghost crab actually are hiding inside the burrow during the daytime, and the ghost crab only only come out of the burrow at night. So you, you, it will be quite interesting to examine what the burrow inside look like. So if you think about any method, you can examine so the, the burial structure of ghost crab or because it's quite deep, so how, how to examine the, the burial structure. So one of the methods is using uh, the plaster of, of Paris. That means it's some, something of calcium sulfate, which when you mix with, with water, it will harden. So uh, you can mix some calcium sulfate with water and then pile inside the, the, the burial of the ghost crab. And then the calcium sulfate will, will be infiltrate all the burrows and when the, when the burrow opening is filled with the calcium sulfate, then it will actually leave the, 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 the burrow to, to dry out, and then you will dig, dig up the burrow, and then you, you, you can examine the structure of the burrows. So I, I have published a paper in 2006 actually examining uh, about the burrow structure of ghost crab at different age. So on, on some small size individual, the burrow is quite shallow, and they're draped, single tray shape. Because this small crab, they need to go out of water for, for water they kill uh, actually and regular time intervals. So the burrow is quite shallow and quite simple in structure. But however, for some larger crabs, they are actually they need to hide the, the inside the whole burrow for the daytime and they only go out at night. So the burrow is, is a little bit more complicated. So usually there are some burrows which, which have a, a Y-shaped burrows, and only one end of the Y will extend to the surface. And then it, it go down with end with a large chamber, and then the other side, the, the, uh, some other shape is a spiral burrow, which uh, a long spiral and down with a chamber. So it seems larger crab have, have a big chamber for, 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 for them to hide during the daytime, and then for some older crab, it seems the burrow is quite deep as well, but only some some only straight two burrows. So why the burrow should be so deep in 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 depth? So it, actually. Because burrow can provide an environment for the crab to escape from the heat and desiccant stress during the summer day times. So I've measured about the temperature of the sand surface on the beach during the uh, summer in Hong Kong. So actually the sand surface can reach about the temperature 44 degrees. So it's very hot already, which you will feel pain when, when your barefoot stand on, on, on the sand. And then I have the temperature prop going inside of the burrows. Can actually, my temperature probe can maximum is go to about two uh, two hundred and fifty meters uh, millimeters. So it, it shows that even in that short distance, the temperature drop from forty four degree to thirty two degree. So it is more than ten degree drop only on on two point five cm depth. So it seems the, the the depth can can give a very low temperature and humid environments for the crab to escape. 
from, from such stressful environment during daytime. And then we go to mid shore, on, on, on the sandy shore, again we'll see some special kind of animals, so they will have a mushrooms and snail and bivalve. And today we'll talk about some more on mushrooms. So in mushroom actually um, in Chinese is Lu Gang Sha Hou. So what is mean by Sha Hou? So I think uh, maybe some people, uh, if you've gone to, to the place called Lu Gang in Taiwan, you will see a lot of shrimps uh, actually sailing on, on the streets. And this is called a Sha Hou. So in Taiwan, this shrimp will be using for deep fry for food and also uh, working for soy sauce as well. But however, this shrimp actually is, is quite important species on sandy shore because this shrimp can actually build a burrow for, uh, forever for their life they're living inside of the burrow uh, for, for, for the rest of their life and will not come out so if the burrow are quite permanent and quite important so what, what is, is the structure of, the, of those burrows? so again, if you think about any method to examine the, the burrow of those mushrooms the burrow are very thin actually and this, this burrow are wet with water so it seems that you can't use the calcium sulfate to, um, to solidify the burrow because it's, it's full of water and instead we can use the epoxy resins, so which is a uh, plastic polymer that will still solidify underwater. So we we'll inject the polymer uh, inside of the burrows and allow them to, to, to solidify and then we, we can still take up the burrow. So you, you see the photograph here, the left hand side of the burrow is Y shaped. So you can see actually the burrow have two openings, uh, actually the, the two openings will extend to the surface of, uh, to the, surface of the sands. So think about why, why they have um, the two openings extend to the surface. Is, uh, are they using for escape or are there any special functions? So if you know that the, the shrimp actually living inside the burrow for the rest of their life or for a long time, they will not escape out of the burrow. So the, 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 the wild shrimp burrow is, is not using for escape from predator. But however, the feeding modes of this mushroom, they are suspension feeder. So they need to feed on, on, on plantons. So that's why they, they need to have a wild shrimp burrow because the one end of the burrow will actually have water going in during high tides and then the water will go inside the burrow and then leaving out the burrow on, on, on the other side of the burrow so there will be a continuous flow of water along the, the, the upper u shape of the burrow and this can allow the, the stream to get the oxygen and food from the incoming tides and then after the upper u, you can, you can see actually the, the, the burrow going very deep on, on, uh, down in, 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 into the substratum and this actually give the, the shrimp for protection because they can actually bury very deep and avoid for, 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 for the uh, predations. However, if you look closely on, on the burrow, the wild shape burrow, you can see there are small chambers along the, 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 the tunnel of, 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 the, of the burrows. So can you think about what is those chambers used for? Are they using for storing food or are they using for mating? And this probably is not for these two functions. So if you see that actually the burrow is quite thin, and the bird were actually fitting the, the width of the shrimp. So when the shrimp going up, they need to go down, they need to have uh, some area for them to U-turn. So the small chamber on, on the burrow is allowed the shrimp and go up, they need to U-turn and then going down again for uh, the, the burrow. So the, those chamber is quite important for the shrimp to, to, to turn around uh, inside the burrow and up, up the burrow and down the burrow. And this is quite important function for, for them to live inside the burrow for a long time. And since the shrimp are actually, uh, the are living in each of the burrow for a long time. So how they carry out mating and, and reproductive activity. So during the mating season, if you also, also uh, uh, examine the, the burrow structure of the stream, you'll find that actually the wild shape burrow have connect, connection channel, a tunnel for each other. That means maybe two wild shape tunnel will have some connecting tunnel to, get to each other. And that means maybe a male stream and a female stream can meet each other on tunnel for mating. And after mating, those tunnels will shut down and, 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 the, and the stream um, be, uh, become separate again, so they have some special mode to detect who, who is uh, surrounding the burrow, who, who is a female or male, and then they can build some connecting tunnel to other people's home and uh, for mating. And then, after looking at, at, at the mud stream, sometimes on, on the sandy shore, we will also discover some small holes of burrows, and the burrow have a lot of uh, sand balls around the burrows. And, and what are the burrow of those animals? And these are actually the burrow of sand bubble crab of the genus Scopimera. So the sand bubble crab actually are a small size crab and they are deposit feeder, so they were feeding on, on, on the sands using, using the, 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 the mouth parts 
And other feeding, they produce a sand ball, which is a, a, a pseudo pellet. And then this, this sand ball will distribute along the, the burrow and, and without, in some way, eating pattern around the burrow. And the, 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 the sand bubble crab are feeding on the myofauna, so that the deposit feeders. Another important group of crab on, on sandy soil is called the soldier crabs. The soldier crab actually are the genus Mectris. So why they call soldier crab? Because actually these crab are moving in large group on, on, on the sandy soil. So whenever you go to the mangrove, you will see that there's some, some kind of crab that they're moving like a large troop of soldier uh, walking around the, the sandy soil, and these are, are called soldier crabs. And why are they little, uh, moving in a large group? Because actually this can reduce the, the, the chance of, of being catched by the birds as, as, as predators. So just imagine you, if you are walking in a large group, the chance of being picked up by, by, by a bird will, will be reduced rather than you just walking along uh, on, on the beach. So there's some special adaptation for this crab to survive. So after talking about the soldier crabs, so there are also other kind of crab which are also important for, for the sandy shore. And these crab are temperate burrows, and these crab are called feeder crabs. So in the genus called yuca. So in, in Chinese it's uh, zhao chao xie. Yeah? And what is, is mean by feeder crab? Because um, the male feeder crab have one pair, one one large chelae and one small chelae, and then the female crab will only have two small chelae. So what is the function of male have large chelae? And actually this is for fighting and also for attracting the, the, the female. So usually a bigger chelae, that means it's a, a, stronger, a, a stronger male, and this, this crab can attract uh, more attractive for females. And the deposit feeder, so actually they're using the small chelae for feeding. So that means uh, the male crab only have one chelae for feeding, and then the, the female crab have two chelae for feeding. So the, the feeding efficiency of females um, actually is higher than male. But when we think about that, actually female will also need more energy to produce eggs and, and for, for, for the offspring. So they also need more energy for, for food as well. So that's why maybe they have two, two pairs of, of feeding chelae for them to get more energy. So talk about the most, most of crabs are, are predators and also they are the deposit feeders. And on sandy shore, there are actually a lot of, of uh, species are scavengers. So what is, is mean by scavenger? Scavenger means it's the, uh, the animal which feed on dead bodies. So they don't only feed on the dead bodies. So the sandy shore actually during high tide, a lot of uh, dead bodies or carrion will be washed up the shore. And during low tide, those dead bodies will be living on the shore. So, and this provides a lot of food for the scavenger to feed on. So one kind of important scavenger on sandy shore is, is a kind of small snail. They're called, they, they're actually under the genus Necessarius. And this snail is, is quite special because in general, if you go to the sandy shore, you can't see them. You can't find them uh, just by eye because it, it seems uh, you, you can't find them every, uh, uh, everywhere on the shore. But however, if you drop maybe some piece of fish meat or crab meat on the shore, Maybe after one or two minutes, you will find that there are a lot of snails walking very fast, and then they get around the dead body for feedings. So why why the snail can uh, can detect the food very, very fast? Because they have a, a very sensitive uh, proboscis, a, 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 a tube, which they can detect the chemical smell of, of the dead body to carry in. So once they detect the, the, the food, they can come in immediately and then come inside the feeding. So in Hong Kong, an experiment have had conducted to examine the feeding time and the feeding behavior of those scavenging snails. So uh, the experiment have uh, put the crab, crab meat and also the, some bivalve meat and then the fish meat on, on, on the shore and to see how long will, 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 will need the snail to appear and come and how long will the snail stay on, on, on the meat to feed. So you, you can see the graph on the right hand side here. The x axis is the time when you put the, the feet on, on, on the shore, the time for the snail to arrive the foot. And then the y-axis is the time they spend on feeding. So if you look at the graph of the crab meat uh, by valve and the fish bait as well. So if you look at the x-axis, it, it seems mostly if you put the bait on the shore, it takes about two to four minutes, just a short time, there will a lot of snail will come. So only four minutes, the, the, the dead body will be gathered up full, full, full of snail to feed on, 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 on those, those carriers. But however, if you look at the y-axis, you, you will see how long the, the snail will spend on feeding the, the, the food. So you will see about 10 to 20 minutes. So it seems it only takes two minutes for the snail to come, 
but the snail only stays for 10 minutes to feeding and then they just go away. So why, why, why the snail only stay for a very short time to feed on, on those dead meat? Have you think about why they don't spend an hour or two hours to enjoy the whole meal because they're a very tiny snail? Can you think about any reason why the snail only stay for a short time to enjoy their meal? So think about scavengers on the shore. So snail is one kind of scavengers. But there are many larger scavengers like crabs and fish that also like, like to eat the, the dead meat as well. So if the snail stay too long on, 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 on the base, that means other, other larger predators and scavengers will come, will also feed on the snail as well. So the snail must be some, some kind of, of special adaptation. This will be working very fast, arrive the food before the larger, larger individual, larger animal come, and then only feed on, 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 food, on very short times. And then they're leaving, they leave the shore, they, they leave the food before the, the large predator comes. And this actually, they can avoid being predated by, by other animals. So this is a very special kind of adaptation for this snail. So they can detect the food uh, in a very sensitive way. They can walk very fast, but they only stay a very short time. So they enjoy the, the, the first meals before other, other, other people come to, to, to en 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 enjoy the, the, the rest of, of, the, of the bodies. So there's some kind of, uh, some special scavenging snail on the shore, on sandy shores. So we talk about a lot of uh, about a lot of species of on, on Taiwan shores. So actually, if we know Taiwan have very high diversity of species, so what can we do actually to protect our diversity? So one thing is conserve is, is, is the conservation of the, the inner tidal shore of our our Taiwan. So how to conserve our inner tidal environments? So first, I, I would advise the, the students and not to over collect animals. So. For some people, when, when they go to the shore, they see the beautiful uh, a, a snail, and beautiful clams, and beautiful crab, they'll collect a lot and back, go, take back home. And, and this actually is, uh, is no help to the environment. It will only cause over collection, and the animal will die in your home. So I, I, I would advise to not bring the organism back to your home aquarium, just observe them on the shore and enjoy the, the, the nature on, on, the, on the Taiwan shore. And when, when, when we're going out for, um, for research trips, so we will, sometimes we will put up the shore and uh, the, the rocks to examine the, the animals. So when we put up the rocks, we, we need to put back the same position of, of, of the rock on, on, on the shore. So to, to allow the, the, the animal on, on the bottom of the rock to, to, to survive. If you, you take up the rock and then just, just throw it away, actually the animal will die. So okay, this is another way to conserve our inner title. And in southern Taiwan and, and also in Green Island, Lidao, we have a lot of coral on, 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 on the shallow water as well. So when you swim or, or we snorkel around, so don't step on the coral because stepping on coral also will damage the coral reef as well. So if you want to enjoy the, the, the nature, enjoy the inner tidal soil, we need to actually pay effort to conserve our, our environment. So now let us go to the end of lecture. So now we look at the learning outcome again to see whether we can achieve our learning outcomes. So uh, the first one, can you describe the major inner tidal organism living in Taiwan? So we, we talk we talk about actually the inner tidal shore have uh, distinct sonation patterns. So on rocky shore we have the uh, tiny snail, the little the one is, uh, snail species, and the grazers, and those snails lead to living in, in groups in clumps on the high shore because the high shore environment is, is too hot and dry, and the living in groups can actually can reduce the the, <coughs> the stress and can increase the humidity and allow them to live in better. And on the mid shore we look at the, the limpets, the one of the major grazers. And some limpet will have ho some homing behavior. So some limpet will, will, will feed, and other thing they will go back to the same pace and, and uh, of the resting pace. And this is called a homing species. But however, not all limpet are homing. Some some are not homing. They they activity is initiated by ties. And we talk about barnacles and barnacles. They are crustaceans and they are feeder feeders. So they actually will, will have six pair of legs for feedings. And barnacle cannot move, but their larvae it can disperse around the the water columns and then disperse to other, other shore and settle to become a, another sex out animal again. And we talk about the hermit crab, which, uh, <coughs> and, and which is a relation with the, with the sea anemone. So on sandy shore, we talk about the, the ghost crab on, on the high shore. So the ghost crab are, are the major predator on the shore, and actually the burrow is, is quite complicated and quite deep. And then on the mid shore, we find that the muck stream, the, 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 the muck stream uh, is with fam famous seafood uh, in, the, in the south of Taiwan. But however, the muck stream are of suspension feeder, so that the bird is, is Y shaped, so the, on, on the top is U shaped, for allow them to actually to get uh, enough oxygen and food. And then uh, they have very deep uh, down the bird is, is for protection. And then we talk about some uh, soldier crabs and sand crab and also feeder crab as well. 
And finally, we talk about some uh, scavengers, the scavenger snail, which are important uh, um, in component of the sand soil to remove the, the dead bodies. And finally, it's quite important to conserve our shore because in Taiwan, we have a lot of species, so we need to observe them on the shore and don't bring back the animal to our homes. And, then, uh, and this can actually allow them to appreciate our diversity and conserve our Taiwan in a tidal environment. Thank you.